Good morning, Randy. Good morning. The Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. Pursuant to Committee Rule 2F and House Rule 112H4, the Chair announces that he may postpone roll call votes on matters in which the yeas and nays were ordered until the end of the markup. Welcome to today's full Committee business meeting. We meet today for two purposes to authorize the issuance of subpoenas and to mark up H.R. 2850, the EPA Hydraulic Fracturing Study Improvement Act. Pursuant to notice, I now call up the resolution authorizing the issuance of subpoenas to the Environmental Protection Agency to obtain data from certain studies, and the clerk will report the resolution. Resolution offered by Mr. Smith. Be it resolved that the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, that upon adoption of this resolution, the chairman of the committee is authorized to issue subpoenas Ducis tecum, for any and all research data, information, documents, and other records which may be de-identified relating to the Harvard Six City Study. Without objection, the resolution will be considered as read and open uh, for amendment at any point. Now, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Today, we consider the committee's first subpoena in 21 years. Unfortunately, we've been put in this position by an agency that willfully disregards congressional request and makes its rules using undisclosed data. This subpoena could have been avoided. For almost two years, this committee has been waiting for the Environmental Protection Agency to release the taxpayer-funded research data it uses to justify its Clean Air Act regulations. At a hearing 20, minute, 20 months ago, then Assistant Administrator Gina McCarthy committed to make the data underlying EPA's claims publicly available. Despite multiple requests since that time, the EPA has failed to produce the promised information. In the meantime, the agency has continued to propose and finalize regulations based on this undisclosed data. The EPA has nothing to hide. Why not make the information public as they promised? The EPA should not base its regulations on secret data. By denying the committee's request, the agency prevents Congress from fulfilling its oversight responsibilities and denies the American people the ability to verify EPA's claims. And the EPA's lack of cooperation contributes to the suspicion that the data don't support the agency's actions. The American people deserve all of the facts and have a right to know whether the EPA is using good science. Nearly all of this administration's air quality regulations are justified on the basis of this hidden data. These regulations impose billions of dollars in compliance costs that harm businesses and working families. We need to determine whether those regulations are justified or not. There is another reason to question the EPA. Some of the data may be decades old, in fact, 30 years old or older, and has not been updated or independently verified. Even the President's own Office of Management and Budget has acknowledged that, quote, significant uncertainty remains end quote, about EPA's claims and argued that they, quote, may be misleading, end quote. The American people need to know if the EPA is being honest with them or using the data in a dishonest way. The committee has been more than patient in its request for information. Gina McCarthy committed to providing the data during a September 15, 2011 hearing. When the agency failed to abide by that commitment, the committee again requested the information in letters dated November 15, 2011, December 12, 2011, December 13, 2012, March 4, 2013, and June 12, 2013, and June 29, 2013. After two years of failing to respond, it's clear that the EPA is not going to give the American people what they deserve, the truth about these regulations. The EPA should be held accountable for its actions, and the validity of its regulations should be verified by independent scientists. Because the EPA is not adhering to the very principles of transparency and open government that the President so often proclaims, the Committee will need to approve this subpoena. And that concludes my opening statement, and the gentlewoman from Texas, the ranking member, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today we are meeting to authorize the issuance of a subpoena and also to mark up H.R. 2850 to require certain procedures in the conduct by the Environmental Protection Agency of its study of the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water resources. <clears throat> Let me start off by saying that this is truly a sad day in the storied history of this committee. 
At the start of this con Congress, I had high hopes that we would lead us into a bipartisan fashion. As befits the history of the committee, I have been sorely disappointed. This subpoena resolution is a culmination of a year of hyperpartisan activity, which is unprecedented for our committee. In that regard, the partisan vote to report out the majority's NASA authorization two weeks ago was an unfortunate milestone. Mr. Chairman, I'm unaware in the entire history of this committee of a NASA authorization ever being reported out of a committee on a party line vote. Never. Somehow we are managing to top that unprecedented level of partisanship today with this dreadful subpoena resolution. There are so many problems with both this resolution and with the process you've used to get here that it's difficult to know where to start. Perhaps I should start with the numerous mischaracterizations contained in your July 22nd letter to EPA as well as in the majority's markup memo. In both of these documents, it is insinuated that both the Harvard Six Cities study and the American Cancer Society study are bad science or secret science. However, you provide no evidence to support those claims. Of course, neither of these claims are true. In fact, these studies are seminal works which are widely respected in the scientific community. Moreover, there has been extensive peer review, reanalysis, and validation work on these studies. And these facts should come at no shock to you, as the EPA has pointed this out repeatedly. I'd ask at this point to insert EPA's July 30th response letter to the committee in the record. Can we? Um, without objection, so ordered. Okay. The notion that these studies are EPA's secret science is also false. First of all, neither of these studies were conducted by EPA. Second, none of the data cohorts used in these studies are secret. They are, however, confidential. And for good reason. These cohorts contain the personal health information of over a million American citizens. This information should not, should be highly protected. However, legitimate scientific researchers do have access to this data. And scores of research teams from around the country have access to this data to conduct scientific research. You should know this, Mr. Chairman. You are chair of the Committee on Science. Science, and yet so many turns this Congress, you've exhibited a baffling disregard for the scientific process and the academic and government scientific uh, let me in our country. Let me interrupt the gentlewoman for a second. Uh, at no point in my congressional career have I ever attacked anybody personally and I would appreciate it if she would refrain from imputing my motives as well. Well thank you very much. I'll just read what is a fact here and I'll repeat the last paragraph. You should know Mr. Chairman you are the chair of the science committee. Science and yet at so many turns in this Congress you've existed, exhibited a baffling disregard for the scientific process and the academic and government scientific community in our country. This is another example. And what do you seek in this data? Just yesterday, you readily admitted that you intend to pass this confidential data to third parties. Who, Mr. Chairman? What legitimate scientific researcher can already access this data? I have to assume you will be passing this data to, excuse my language, industry hacks to so blatantly be doing the bidding of this polluting industries is simply mind-boggling. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I demand the gentlewoman's words be taken down. The gentlewoman from Texas will suspend. I have. Before we proceed, would the gentlewoman want to um, reconsider the words that she has been using and perhaps either withdraw them or rephrase them? Mr. Chairman, I stand by my words.
the clerk will need to read the words that have been spoken, and in that regard, we will need to get a transcript of the uh, statement. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Maffei, is recognized. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, I, regular order. Yeah, nothing, that is, nothing can go on until that the is chair correct. rules the, on the, the agenda. The gentleman from Wisconsin is correct. I'm sorry, Mr. Maffei. I'll have to uh, wait I, to recognize you. I withdraw the motion. Mr. Chairman, I move for a 10-minute recess. I think that is in order. Is that the gentleman from Florida I heard? Yes, Mr. And the Chairman. Gentleman, would the gentleman repeat the motion or the request that he just made? Move for a 10-minute recess. I think that actually is in order. Okay. Uh, that is non-debatable. It is in order. And um, if there's no objection, we will have a 10-minute recess. The Science, Space, and Technology Committee will reconvene, and the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask that my offending words be stricken and allowed to be restated. I thank the gentlewoman for making that offer. It's much appreciated, and without objection, uh, the words will be stricken. And uh, does the gentlewoman continue to be recognized, or shall we proceed with the... Uh, uh, yes, I have someone. Okay. What words will be stricken? What, what, what part will be stricken? The clerk will read the words. And for what do you seek this data? Just yesterday you readily admitted that you intend to pass this confidential data on to third parties. Who, Mr. Chairman? What legitimate scientific researcher can already access this data? I have to assume you will be passing this data to, excuse my language, industry hacks. To so blatantly be doing the bidding of the polluting industries is simply mind-boggling. If the data is not going to be provided to industry, either directly or indirectly, members need to know to whom you will be sending it. Okay, thank you for reading the words. And the gentlewoman from Texas continues to be recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, I'm appalled that this committee seems to be doing the bidding of polluting industries. If the data is not going to be provided to industry, either directly or indirectly, members need to know to whom you will be sending it. You know for years the tobacco industry tried every trick in the book to gain access to the American Cancer Society's data so that their own salaried hacks could catch, cast doubt on the link between smoking and cancer. Thankfully, they were largely unsuccessful, and I hope today's efforts will also fail. I want to be clear. This is not legitimate oversight. This is not an appropriate role for this committee. My job is not to undermine public health at the explicit behest of polluting industries. Like the subpoena resolution, H.R. 2850 is a continuation of the same theme of political mismanagement of the scientific process. I'll have more specific comments in my statement on the bill, but for now I'm simply going to say that it doesn't seem very well thought out. Mr. Chairman, we can and should do better than this. I sincerely hope that as we move forward, the majority will cease their senseless attacks on the scientific process and the scientific research community. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Are there other members who wish to be heard on this resolution? The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Stewart, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing and thank you for the gracious and I believe nonpartisan leadership you have shown on these important matters. I know that you have conducted this committee with integrity and fairness and uh, frankly the display of partisanship and personal tax that we've witnessed this morning is an example of the challenge that you have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this resolution and I look forward to you promptly issuing a subpoena to obtain this data. In fact, I would say that I plead with you to issue this subpoena. 
For far too long, the EPA has kept Congress and the American people in the dark concerning claimed benefits of its rules. And I want to re reiterate that very simple message that the committee has been repeating for two years. We should not base regulations on non-transparent information. Is that an unreasonable request? Is that a partisan request? The answer is no and no. And as we all know too well, it's working families that will ultimately foot the bill for the agency's assault on affordable energy. They have a right to see the underlying data. And by the way, the American people get it. In a poll earlier this year, 90% of Americans agreed that studies and data used to make federal government decisions should be made public. If we were only to judge by their words, the administration also appears to support this simple idea. For example, in December 2010, White House memo states that agencies should expand and promote access to scientific information by making it available. This should include data and models underlying regulatory proposals and policy decisions. That apparently doesn't apply to this data or the EPA's clean air rules. Similarly, uh, President Obama's March 2009 scientific integrity memo states there should be transparency in the preparation, identification, and use of scientific and technological information in policy making. By the administration's behavior, that apparently doesn't apply to this data or EPA clean air rules. The President's Executive Order 1356-3 requires that regulations be based on the best available science. This administration's top science advisor appeared to have agreed as well. Dr. John Holdren, the President's science advisor, testified in this room in June 2012 that absolutely the data on which regulatory decisions and other decisions are based should be made available to the committee and should be made to the public. This sentiment has been endorsed by other respected parts of the federal scientific enterprise. The National Academy of Sciences states that when the government funded research is used for decision making, data sharing allows for analysis of problems by investigators with diverse perspectives. The Administrative Conference of the U.S. is an independent federal agency that includes EPA as its member. In an amazing case of what I believe is sheer hypocrisy, even the EPA's own scientific integrity policy states that scientific research and analysis compromise the foundation of all major EPA policy decisions. Therefore, the agency should maintain vigilance toward ensuring that science, research, and results are presented openly and with integrity, accuracy, timeliness, and a full public scrutiny demanded when developing sound, high-quality environmental science. At this point, we have no way of knowing if these data sets support the claims made by the agency. This issue is too important simply to trust the EPA. This committee has, as you stated, Mr. Chairman, has been asking the agency for this information for two years. Instead of integrity, accuracy, and timeliness as the agency's policy requires, we get excuses, inaccuracies, and delay, as we saw in their uh, most recent letter of just a few days ago. I believe that this must come to an end, and I support the subpoena effort, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Maffei, is not, I thought, wanted to be recognized. If not, are there other members? The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some questions about the resolution itself, and I'll yield to you or anyone else uh, involved in the drafting of the resolution who can try to clarify these points for me. Um, with regard to the wording of the resolution, it refers to the Environmental Protection Agency and a subpoena to other custodians of research data from such studies. Uh, who are the other custodians? Uh, the gentleman, who are the other, what was the last word the gentleman said? Who are the other custodians referred to in the resolution? It might be uh, one of two, perhaps both, um, both Harvard and the Cancer Institute. Well, and let me, let me say, I don't expect to issue subpoenas to them because I don't think it will be necessary. I believe the EPA either has the data or can get access to the data. So uh, I'm hoping that that would be uh, sufficient, just the EPA subpoena. Well, I think the chairman can understand uh, the concern that one might have with regard to the phrase other custodians of research data without identifying who that might be. It could be literally thousands of different people. Uh, is there some uh, way that we can modify this resolution to be specific to the intended recipients and not be what amounts to a legal blank check? I yield. Okay. 
um, if the gentleman will yield, uh, it's my understanding that the reason for a somewhat broad subpoena is because we don't know who the EPA will point to if they deny having the data themselves, which would be a surprise because if they don't have the data, how could they issue regulations based upon that data? Uh, but in any case, should they say they don't have the data, uh, we would want to follow the trail wherever it might take us and find those who do have the data. Again, I don't think it's going to be necessary, but uh, this is a standard procedure when you uh, write a subpoena. Well, I'll reclaim my time. I am concerned, again, that this, in theory, would allow a subpoena to virtually anybody who might conceivably have such data uh, and allow a fishing expedition. If the chairman were, for instance, to consider an amendment that would say uh, the custodians of research data identified by the EPA and limited to EPA identified entities that have data that the EPA itself does not have, then I think that the claim that this is a fishing expedition would be somewhat neutralized. respond to the gentleman by asking him this question. Um, that has a certain appeal to me, except that what if the EPA refuses to identify the custodians of the data? Well, in that case, I would suggest that there's no way to go forward. Uh, the, if the EPA uh, won't tell you who has the data, then how would you ever know? Yeah, uh, it, but that's exactly the point for having a subpoena written in the way it is now, is to be able to try to find out who those individuals might be and who the custodians of the data um, are so that we could try to access that information. Well, this has the force of law. If you, you are asking for a subpoena, Duces Tecum, to the APA uh, to identify the people who have the data. Right. So they would be required by law to do so. My time's a little limited. I wanted to raise another point with regard to this and see if it's possible to make this more specific. Uh, the, the chair will note that the resolution that the chair has offered refers to the data that's being provided being de-identified. Can the chairman please be specific about what's the intention of that term? I'd be happy to. Uh, initially, the EPA s said that we might be wrongfully identifying individuals, and uh, when we talk about health information that might involve the names of particular individuals, we did not want those names to be made public for obvious reasons and by de-identifying, which is a term of art, I am told, that will protect the identity of those individuals uh, whose health information we might have. So uh, we want to, again, protect privacy and de-identify is a term of art that allows us to do that. Well, I think to be fair under these circumstances that that should be mandatory. Would the chair entertain an amendment that changes the word may to the word shall? Um, um, while we're considering that, Mr. Grayson, I also think I can read you, if you're interested in knowing more specifically about uh, how individuals are de-identified, I'll be happy to give you more information on that, or are you satisfied with the de-identification process? No, I'd like to learn more about that. I, I think that we've raised serious concerns on this side of the aisle concerning the release of personal private health information to not only individual staff here on the committee, but also to apparently people outside this committee, and I think it's a legitimate concern. Okay. Uh, if the gentleman will further yield, let me go into a little bit more details on the de-identification. Uh, the resolution explicitly allows for de-identification of all information being provided. That means that no individual names will be made public. Our request, uh, therefore, I believe is reasonable. Why should taxpayers be denied access to the data that is provided to the EPA grantees? Uh, let me see if I can get more on the uh, de-identification. Well, based on what the chairman here, here said, is, I'd be concerned if, if I, about the word public. Okay, uh, if I may continue just briefly, and then, um, uh, then I'll yield back. That in 2005, the National Academy of Sciences described, quote, relatively simple data masking techniques and de-identification uh, is an approach that has worked more than 40 years. They stated that nothing in the past suggests that increasing access to research data without damage to privacy and confidentiality rights is beyond scientific reach and so forth. I can get you more information, but the idea there is that uh, uh, the National Institute says that it is almost always possible to de-identify data so individual identity is protected and analysis is possible. As far as your second question, whether we should make it uh, mandatory shall rather than permissive may, let me check on that for a Thank you. Minute. I see I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that objection, the gentleman is recognized for an additional minute.
Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, the, the de-identification that you're talking about seems to me to be essential here, not only in terms of releasing the information to the public, but also, frankly, protecting it from our, uh, anyone here who receives it uh, and anyone who may be given the information, wh whether or not that would be pr considered to be a member of the public. The, there are unspecified plans at this point, uh, at least unspecified to the minority, concerning who will be receiving this information, and perhaps the chairman can shed some light on that. As far as individuals who will receive the information, there are any number of um, scientists and scientific organizations uh, who um, are interested in looking at the data and engaging in an, their own independent analysis. And I think it wouldn't be fair to identify individuals, organizations. Uh, they will be abundantly clear if we do get the data. And Ms. Gration, I'd like to ask this, that I'd like to go on and recognize some more individuals to speak on the resolution while we check on the uh, question that you raised about whether it should be mandatory or permissive, if that's all right. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, the gentleman from California, whoop, let me see if there's a gentleman on this side first. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bouchard, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to speak in support of the resolution. Since my election to Congress, and particularly during my current role as Chairman of the Research and Technology Subcommittee, I have had the opportunity to look closely at this administration's track record on scientific integrity and the lack of transparency of federally funded research. As a cardiothoracic surgeon, I'm both interested and experienced in the intersection of the environment and health. It's irresponsible that a federal agency supported by taxpayer dollars has refused to hand over this data. With large coal and agriculture industries in my district, I have seen firsthand the detrimental effects of EPA regulations have on these industries when they're based on ideology instead of sound science. At a hearing my subcommittee her heard held earlier this year, we heard a consensus view that only with open access to data can we ensure integrity and credibility in the scientific process. This is especially important when it comes to government regulations and decisions that affect all Americans' health and financial well-being. Witnesses testified that many published research findings may be false, and access to this data is necessary to validate and understand scientific claims. They also pointed out that the types of observational epidemiological studies that underlie EPA's claims are particularly problematic. A few of my colleagues have raised concerns about sensitive health information within these data sets. I have no such concerns. Aggregate scientific data is published daily in medical journals such as the New England Journal of Medicine, the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, amongst many others. Hiding behind HIPAA regulations is a tactic to stonewall Congress and its ability to obtain data. The committee rules allow that the chairman, in addition, can deem documents resulting from a subpoena to be received in an executive session in order to further prevent the release of any sensitive information. This resolution is entirely reasonable, and the American people should have access to the same information that is provided to taxpayer-funded EPA grantees. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this meeting and for holding the agency's feet to the fire. We have seen the agency this agency and this administration conducting a calculated war on coal and other fossil fuels with the risk of skyrocketing, elect skyrocketing electrical prices in European style energy markets. The EPA should release the data that underlines this campaign in order for independent experts to objectively examine their claims. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bouchon. The gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, is recognized. Chairman, thank you. I uh, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I would just express a concern, um, obviously I had not been through this process before, but just in terms of transparency, uh, the notion that people are, are concerned about the validity of the data, we don't know who they are, and um, obviously the committee itself does not have the expertise to, to review this. So I feel like I'm a little bit in the dark, ironically, on an issue about transparency where this concern is coming from. Uh, and with that, I, on the issue of, uh, raised by Mr. Grayson, I would uh, like to yield to the ranking member, Ms. Johnson, uh, for additional comment. Thank you very much. As I mentioned in my opening statement, I'm strongly opposed to this subpoena resolution. To put it simply, there is no basis for this action and there is no legitimate action for this committee to take. The majority has indicated that EPA has, been forth uh, has not been forthcoming with information. I intend to demonstrate just how ridiculous this assertion is. If my staff can assist me, I want to first have the staff put out the EPA's regulatory impact analysis for the rules cited by the majority in their markup memo. 
Found in these thousands of pages of documents are detailed explanations of the methodologies used to arrive at EPA's cost and benefit analysis, which the chairman is presumably questioning. Second, could the staff please put out the integrated science assessment for particulate matter and integrated uh, science assessment for ozone? Here is over 3,000 pages of peer-reviewed science. One would think this would be enough for anyone. Third, could the staff please put out the report on the National Research Council entitled Estimating Public Health Benefits for Proposed Air Pollution Regulations? In this report, the most prestigious scientific society in our country largely endorses the methods and results of these two research studies that we claim to be sloppy EPA science. Fourth, could the staff please put out the Health Effects Institute reanalysis of two studies in question? This independent peer-reviewed study by HEI, which is partially funded by the auto industry, confirmed the methods and results of the two studies in question. It is precisely the kind of research reanalysis you're claiming to need this data for, and obviously it's already been conducted. Finally, could the staff please put out the de-identified data that EPA provided to the committee from Harvard Six Cities study. Here's all 900 pages of it. Please note that this is precisely the information we are authorizing a subpoena for today. It would seem that EPA has already provided you with what we seek, since it is sitting right in front of us. Mr. Chairman, since the majority has claimed that they don't have enough science to review, I think it would be good for all of these materials to be inserted into the record of these proceedings so that we will, it would be accessible to all the majority, and I move that the committee do so. Does the gentleman from California? No. I, I just offered a motion. Mr. Chairman? I move that uh, the um, materials be inserted into the record so they'll Without be Without objection, so ordered. Okay. Thank you. I uh, wait a minute. Um, okay. Without objection, so ordered. What? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. <coughs> no. I'm trying. The gentleman from California, Mr. Peter, still has the time, and I believe okay. Ms. Johnson has some more comments to make. No, I, I really think that I've made my point. There is no secret science here. In contrast, what we have is literally mountains of peer-reviewed research which supports these studies. And I just simply wanted to make sure that the record reflected that it is available. Okay. The gentleman at this time, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, seeks to be recognized. Okay. okay, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nogabar, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to speak in support uh, of the resolution. Um, I'm disappointed that we have to issue a subpoena in order to uh, get APA to live up of its obligations to Congress and the American taxpayers. But for the last two years, our requests for information have gone unanswered. The data we're requesting is used to justify major decisions by EPA, decisions that cost American businesses billions of dollars in compliance costs. What's more, the data is paid for by hardworking American taxpayers. So why don't we have access to it? The administration is paying lip service to transparent government, but their actions speak louder than words. All they Although they claim that independent uh, validation of their science is important, they don't share the data that would allow for outsider, outside scientists to verify their claims. Unfortunately, the only information EPA has provided is air quality data that is already public information. But EPA has admitted that this isn't sufficient to validate their claims. The Texas Commission for Environmental Quality said that the limited data released the files provided lack critical information, making it impossible to replicate their findings. There are real consequences from EPA's regulations. They cost the American businesses money and time, and they, that they could be investing in creating more jobs for American families. The administration has the responsibility to the American people to be open about how uh, these decisions are made, and that includes releasing data so that it can be held up for public scrutiny. 
America has deserved transparent, accountable government, and I hope our vote today uh, uh, helps achieve that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would yield to the Chairman uh, balance my time if he'd like. All set. Thank you, Mr. Nogabar. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Wilson, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The data being sought by the majority was collected from American citizens. These people volunteered their health info information to help further the cause of improving the health of our country through scientific research. They did not volunteer this information for the purposes of furthering a partisan political divide. When cohort participants enroll in ACS cohorts, they're given explicit assurances that their volunteered information will be securely stored, accessed only by approved researchers who have received training in the handling of human subject data and never shared with unapproved third parties like insurance companies. They're also assured that the information being volunteered will only be used for research purposes of the American Cancer Society. By commandeering this information from these organizations or from EPA, the majority is breaking the trust that these volunteers relied upon when they enrolled. This will have a chilling effect on the enrollment of future cohorts. As noted above, the American Cancer Society is currently enrolling a new cohort, CPS3, for use in further studies. ACS and other research organizations must have broad and diverse, and I mean diverse, representation in their cohorts to achieve the most accurate results in their research. This will be difficult to do if potential volunteers think that their personal information will be subpoenaed for political purposes. Mr. Chairman, the so-called secret science is science for the sake of cancer patients, sick children, and communities struggling with pollution and environmental crisis. It's the people's science. There are brown fields <clears throat> in the core of the inner cities of our nation. In my district, there are many brown fields. This subpoena will undermine this science for the sake of corporate polluters. Mr. Speaker, when I was principal of an elementary school, they built a composting plant across from the school called AgriPost. It was alien technology, experimenting with school children. If it were not for the EPA, all of us would probably be dead. So how do we define scientific organizations? Some experiment with alien technology like AgriPost. I need to know how do we define scientific organizations? And whose side are we on as a Congress? Will the gentlelady yield does for a it, question? Does it, would the gentleman I, have you? A, I asked a question. Oh. I asked a question. How do we define scientific organizations that this information will be released to? That some are experiment with alien technology. I've had that experience. Uh, my county allowed a $27 million plant to be built across the street from my elementary school that turned garbage into fertilizer that would have killed every child in the school had it not been for the EPA to shut it down with my help. So I need, I need a, an answer. Okay. Does the gentleman, is the gentleman yield back her time or was that I last yield back the time for the answer of the question. Okay. Well, I think, I think the uh, answer has already been given, but I'll be brief in giving it again. There are any number of independent organizations and scientists as well who would be interested in looking at this data uh, by making it public without identifying the individuals. Uh, we are going to be able to proceed as we have with any other number of agencies that make that kind of data public and then it is scrutinized by various reputable entities and organizations. 
Um, that's the standard process. That's the standard scientific review process. Um, Mr. Chair. The, yes. Has anyone thought about how, how we're going to compromise the personal information of individuals who have uh, volunteered? It's very difficult to get people to volunteer their information if yeah. they know it's going to be okay. shared with a third if the, party. If the gentleman will yield, let me repeat again that this information will be de-identified. No individual's identity will be revealed and therefore the privacy will, their privacy will be protected. Will, will the gentlelady yield for a the, question? The gentleman's, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swikert, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is one of those moments, and I think we've all had these, where you have the beautiful written script in front of you, and you'd love to go through it, but um, I think actually we're missing the point, and the conversation has almost reached a portion of the absurdity. Um, and maybe I look at this slightly different. Um, as a sick young man, I wanted to be an actuary. So statistics, you know, modeling was much of what I really cared about. And you point to a stack like that, and that's great. It's someone else's modeling. And we can look at how they modeled it. But I thought we were all actually, we both right and left had agreed to this concept of open government, egalitarian access to information. That's why we love the internet. And the fact of the matter is you want data sets that are paid for by taxpayer money to be open and egalitarian. It's easy to strip off private information. We do that constantly. We do that every single day. But with that data out there, yes, there's going to be industry groups that use it. But yes, there'll be environmental groups that use it. There'll be a university. Hell, someone sick like me may be sitting in their basement with their computers trying to model it and understand how it works. Were there, uh, is there something, is there equal weighting? Weighting and building the model is what's happening in the weighting in the tails of the data. But if we're going to be making decisions if the EPA is going to be making decisions that cost trillions of dollars to the economy, but may have tr multiple trillions of dollars in benefits or may not, we as a community, right, left, just academic, need to have access to that information and work it and work it and work it and work it because if we're going to do this to all of us, it needs to be a communal sort of decision making of they got this right, they got this wrong, you screwed up on the way you weighted this, no you did this, but that's how this type of decision making that's going to affect our lives and our kids' lives and our grandkids' lives and the economy within that, we need to do this collectively. And I, I'm, I find it absurd that what was going to be an incredibly open society because of access to data, because of the access to the information, because of the access to the internet, we're actually engaging in this conversation. And in some ways, it breaks my heart. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Swikert. Are there other members Chairman. who wish to be recognized? The, general, the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. I just want to say very quickly, okay. um, the EPA has offered and has submitted all of their research. The research that is not here was not done by EPA nor a contractor from EPA, the American Cancer Society finances their own research, and EPA cannot furnish us with that research. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman. We'll consider that to have been yielded to you, Ms. Johnson, and the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm concerned about the majority's uh, clear overreach and grab to subpoena the EPA and potentially non-governmental entities, the American Can Cancer Society and Harvard University. In this case, the data the majority are looking for is not owned or created by the EPA. It's data that come out of two studies done by two non-governmental organizations. The EPA has no more right to give this data away than, and I'm going to make this really easy for the majority to understand, an auto mechanic has the right to sell your car when he has it in the shop. That's how much control the EPA has over that data. 
and the two entities that were created, uh, that created the data based on their long-term studies are the American Cancer Society and Harvard University. It's really disturbing to me that the majority, which is shown in this committee, that it holds the industry in the highest regard is attempting to subpoena these two august institutions for documents they've already, st they already state on their website are publicly available, and I have a slide to show exactly that. Um, in the highlighted, yellow highlighted area, it says that the American Cancer Society Epidemiology Research Program investigators recognize the value and welcome exter externally proposed studies judged to be of general interest and high scientific merit. And here are the important part. Investigators who are not employed by ACS's e Epidemiology Research Program may request access to CPS data and or biospecimens to conduct a study. <laughs> It's available by the entity. Uh, the slide from the American Cancer Society and its website clearly indicate that access to the data the majority intends to subpoena for researchers is already available to all legitimate researchers who apply. So it really begs the question whether the majority really intends to subpoena the American Cancer Society to provide data access to scientists who already have it. Maybe the problem the researchers, uh, the majority claims, and I quote from Chairman Smith's July 31st letter, quote, have come forward to the committee to express their concerns that they have been denied access to review the data are really not legitimate researchers at all. And I would yield just for a moment if anyone, anyone in the majority can identify to me, to this committee, to the public, on the record, the names of researchers in the institutions they belong would, would, would the to who have been denied yield? this data. Would the gentleman yield? Just for a minute, I'll names. I'd be happy to identify such individuals. Um, despite uh, the assertions by the EPA that they're making this data public, that is clearly not the case, and a number of individuals have repeatedly been denied. Who are the data. individuals? For example, Dr. Stan Young, Assistant Director of the National Institute of Statistical Sciences, has been denied access to the Harvard Six Studies data. Similarly, Dr. Jim Enstrom, Epidemiologist and Research Professor at the UCLA School of Public Health, has been denied access to the Career Prevention Study 2 data. That's an example of one for each. Okay, so let's, uh, let's hear. So um, according uh, to, uh, to Harvard, um, Dr. Young is acting on his own. He's seeking data sets he believes would be interesting to analyze. It's not an official request from the institution that he works from. It's from an individual, and that can be accessed um, by the individual from uh, from the website. So I don't really understand what the complaint here. Um, the NISS isn't pr promising to do anything. Dr. Young has no authority to commit the institution to do anything, and there aren't any resources available to undertake the analysis. Um, so I'm just curious as to how the majority feels that the EPA hasn't given them the data they requested, actually data they don't own or have, um, have control over. It's the ACS and it's Harvard University, it's not um, the EPA. We have documentation, in fact, showing that EPA's responses and the reams of papers that have been brought in are just a part of all the data the EPA has made available. And given all the d data that EPA has already provided, what I just asked, what more would the majority suggest that EPA has to give for them to comply with the subpoena and therefore avoid what I'm sure would be a contempt citation? Uh, again, I yield to anyone in the majority who could answer that for me, but I don't think there's anybody who can. Uh, it's really clear to, clear to me Gina McCarthy has only been an EPA administrator for two weeks. The majority is already trying to attack her. They did it under the previous administrator, Lisa Jackson, who was attacked equally by members of this committee and Republicans in Congress. Instead of supporting science, the committee is obstructing, it's taking hostage legitimate scientific endeavors of the EPA. It's endangering the lives of the American public. And I have to tell you, to me, it just sounds like getting ready for August, going out so you have something to talk about, but it's not legitimate, and we should stop doing it on this committee. And with the gentlewoman yield one more time. I don't have any time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll, without objection, I'll yield the gentlewoman another 15 seconds to yield to me. Uh, in an April 10th letter, EPA admitted that the limited information that has been provided is, quote, not sufficient, end quote, to analyze or validate the results of these studies. The gentleman's time has expired, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, is recognized. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it's difficult to understand uh, how anyone who is uh, serving on this committee would want to limit the amount of information that is available uh, to us on this committee, especially 
if it deals with why certain scientific decisions are being made, uh, clearly the EPA is making decisions that are significant uh, for the lives of the American people and significant for the policies, not only the, their own policies, but the other policies that we will vote on as, as, a, as a representatives of the American people. If the EPA is making decisions and, and coming uh, to conclusions in, in terms of their own policy, uh, and it's based on information, whatever information that's, their decisions are based on, that information should be made available to us upon our request. I mean, there's just, uh, uh, I, I don't, I, it's, it's mind-boggling that, that there's even any argument about that. If indeed a decision by the EPA is made on certain information, we have the obligation to see if that information is, is accurate, to look at it. And uh, uh, so, I mean, uh, let me just note, uh, this is, uh, it seems to me, this is consistent with what I'm also on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, this is consistent with some of the other things that we've been dealing with in dealing with this administration, which came into power claiming they were going to be the most transparent administration ever. And uh, uh, instead, uh, you know, we've just had uh, people time and again refuse to provide uh, the Congress with information about uh, the issues at hand and, and how, uh, how decisions were made, uh, who is involved, and uh, uh, we have uh, 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 people in this administration taking the Fifth Amendment to try to uh, suggest that they're not going to even tell Congress, much less we've had an Attorney General refusing to, to give us information. This is a consistent pattern, and uh, uh, I would think that this committee should be a, a science committee. If any committee should be above and beyond that type of stonewalling or, or, or roadblocks to, to uh, uh, tracking down information, it should be the science committee. So if indeed decisions are being made by the EPA based on information, I repeat, that information should be made available to all of us. And I thank you very much for your leadership, Mr. Chairman, and standing up for, yes, uh, accountability and transparency, which supposedly this administration was going to be all about, but sadly uh, is, is not anywhere near reaching that goal. I uh, yield back the balance of my Thank time. you, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, is recognized. And then after that, I think we'll have a couple other members be recognized. And I think Mr. Grayson has an amendment as well. Uh, the gentlewoman from Illinois, uh, Ms. Kelly, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I actually was interested in hearing more about what Mr. Grayson was referring to earlier, so I yield my time to him. Mr. S uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we are dealing with really weighty issues of public policy, and I don't want to sound like I'm in any way distracting or derogating from that debate, but nevertheless, we're talking about a legal procedure here, a subpoena, uh, and I think that it's important that we recognize that there are rules that apply to this sort of thing, and if we're going to do something like this at all, then it's important to do it right. Uh, the Constitution requires in the Fourth Amendment particularity, uh, meaning that we have to specifically identify the person, place, or thing that's being sought. And this is a standard who, what, where, when, and how type of test. I believe that the phrase that's in this resolution that's been offered by the chair inadvertently steps over the boundary established by the Fourth Amendment with the phrase and other custodians of research data from such studies, because it doesn't identify specifically who that might be. Um, I think that there are two possible ways to solve this problem. I and don't want to be taken in any way as endorsing this resolution, because I don't. But again, if I think we're going to do this, we need to do it in a way that respects the Constitution. One way to solve the problem would be to say, as I indicated earlier, that we can enumerate the specific recipients. It could be the Environmental Protection Agency, the American Cancer Society and Harvard University. I believe constitutionally that's the preferred manner to do this, and in fact I think an argument can be made that it's the only way to do it that comports with the Constitution. Alternatively, as I mentioned earlier, one could try to do it by saying that uh, the subpoena applies to the EPA and those parties identified by the EPA as being custodians of the research data. I think that that's sort of sketchy. Um, I think it still could be held to be unconstitutional, but in, in any case, it would have a shot at being held to be constitutional. 
I think this is important. We are talking about private entities like the American Cancer Society, the Harvard University uh, researchers. These are entities that have both the motivation and the means to challenge a subpoena like this in court. So I would suggest, and I'll be offering an amendment to this effect, that we limit uh, the subpoena and amend the subpoena in one way or the other in the manner that I just described in order to make it at least facially, superficially constitutional. Uh, I yield back to the gentlelady, Ms. Kelly. And I yield the remainder of my time. Okay, the gentlewoman yields back. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the resolution? And if not, we'll go to Mr. Grayson to offer his amendment. Mr. Chair. Yeah, that's terrible. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the gentlewoman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Bonamici, Ms. Bonamici. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a, 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 wor a wording question about the resolution, and I'll, I'll address it to you as the, the chairman. Mr. Chairman, this resolution calls for the issuance of subpoenas, Ducey's take em, relating to the Harvard 6 study, yeah. the Cancer Prevention Study 2, which uh, I trust is the American Cancer Society's Cancer Prevention Study 2, and all analysis and reanalysis of either study. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those uh, original Harvard 6 study and American Cancer Society's Cancer Prevention Study 2, it's my understanding those are from the 90s. So can you please explain what this uh, resolution is seeking by asking for and all analysis and reanalysis of either study? And I yield for a response. Okay. I'll be happy to try to respond. And the phrase all analyses and reanalyses of means any subsequent analysis of the Harvard Six Studies or Cancer Prevention Study to data, including but not limited to, and I can go through a long list. So it's just to make sure that we get all the data, all the information uh, that we want. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I reclaim my time and would like to speak in opposition to the proposed a broadly drafted authorization of subpoenas. And as, as you explained earlier this morning, Mr. Chairman, it's been 21 years uh, since, since this action, type of action has been taken. This is and should be quite rare here in Congress and especially in this committee. And as already been emphasized, the EPA has turned over voluminous data relevant to the subpoena resolution. They've turned over what they possess or have the legal authority to demand, and we can see that in front of us. Uh, all of the uh, information is in the possession of the committee and there just doesn't appear to be any reason to proceed with this resolution. I also want to note uh, that the wording of the resolution could be read in a way that appears as if the committee may be planning to subpoena the American Cancer Society and Harvard University. Now there was a comment made earlier about how uh, we're looking for data sets paid for by taxpayer money. Uh, this, the American Cancer Society and Harvard University are not paid for by taxpayer money. Uh, this appears to be an attempt to get data that may be then disclosed to yet identif unidentified third parties. I'm very concerned about the chilling effect that such a move would have on the ability to get citizen participation in future studies, uh, even though this uh, information may be uh, de-identified. I hope we do adopt the amendment that uh, changes that to shall. Uh, but however, I, I do not see that this such type of action is within the oversight powers of Congress. Mr. Chairman, the basic threshold of credibility has not been made for this uh, subpoena authorization resolution, and I urge the committee members to oppose it. Will the gentle, gentle lady yield for I, a moment? And I do yield uh, some time, uh, okay. 30 seconds, to the uh, um, Ms. Edwards from Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. I just want to note for the record that the uh, two um, it's, uh, individuals cited by the chairman as having been denied this research. One I indicated uh, who is acting on his own and not uh, for his institution and the other, uh, James In Instrom, it turns out um, was let go from the UCLA and its uh, research uh, department as of June 30th, 2010. And I'd like to enter for the record um, the notice of um, the uh, termination of uh, Dr. Instrom, uh, so I'm not sure he, uh, uh, with whose authority he was acting, and then uh, with respect to uh, Dr. Young. Okay. And I'd uh, yield back to uh, the gentleman. With that objection, that'll be made a part of the record, as will my statement, which is that individual was actually hired back after that brief termination. And Mr. Chairman, and I reclaim my time, and, and I'd like to yield a, a minute to uh, Mr. Grayson from Florida. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'd like some clarification regarding what happens uh, if the committee goes ahead with this and then gets the information. 
uh, the, the, the chairman seems to be contemplating some kind of procedure by which this information will then be disseminated to people who are outside the committee and outside the staff of the committee. How will that occur? Will there be notice to the committee members that it's occurring? Will there be sort of a paper trail involved? Will there be a selection process? Can the chairman please clarify all these questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me try to clarify for the gentleman from Florida. Uh, basically, this information will be made public. And that, as again, it will not be identifying any individual, so privacy will be protected. But uh, those scientists and those scientific institutions who have an interest in the data uh, will be able to analyze it. So the chairman is, in essence, uh, in contemplating something equivalent to posting it on the Internet. Is that correct? It, it would be made public. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Oh, does the gentleman from Florida have an amendment he would like to offer now? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. Okay, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the resolution offered by Mr. Smith, offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. Amendment number one, on line five, change may to shall. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman from Florida is recognized to explain his amendment. Well, currently, based upon what I've heard from the chair today, the contemplation is that this information will be received by the committee and posted in a public manner. Uh, if that information contains any sort of identifying information for any individual, that is a scandal and uh, a travesty. People join these studies in some cases because they have cancer, in some cases because they have some other disease that requires treatment. Uh, it would be appalling, absolutely appalling, to even allow the possibility that personally identifiable information uh, would be released to the public, uh, and I, I, would, I would hesitate to think what would be the, the, the um, oh God, uh, public reaction if such a thing were to occur. Uh, however it may have been intended, uh, the resolution as currently offered has the word may in it. May does not mean shall. Uh, may uh, means that, uh, that, that the, the recipient of the subpoena has the option of de-identifying the data but is not required to do so. I think that it is extraordinarily important that we make sure uh, with belt and suspenders here uh, that this information does not uh, lead to the release of any publicly identifiable information about any individual's health condition. I don't see any way to accomplish that other than to change the word may to shall, and I offer this amendment for that purpose. Okay. The gentleman yields back. I'll recognize myself in opposition. I certainly agree with the gentleman from Florida that it would be a travesty if individuals' names were made public or if they were identified in any way whatsoever. The problem with mandating that uh, the agency uh, shall uh, de-identify individuals is that it gives them an out. If the EPA says we can't de-identify individuals, even though, as I quoted a while ago, we have all types of scientific organizations that say they can be de-identified, but the agency says we cannot, uh, then that um, stymies our uh, efforts to try to get that data. And I'm just simply not willing to allow the EPA to take that out. I am confident that the information will be de-identified, and let me assure the individual uh, right now that we will not release any information uh, that cannot be de-identified. Will, will the chairman yield for a response to that? Yes. I'd be happy to yield to Mr. the gentleman. Chairman, the, the procedure that we're going to be following here is that if this resolution is adopted by the committee, there will be a subpoena or subpoenas issued uh, to uh, the recipients of the subpoena, including the agency and conceivably other parties as well. And that subpoena either will say de-identify or won't say de-identify. If we say shall, then the scenario that the chairman is describing, I believe, is not one that would actually occur. Uh, the, the recipient of that subpoena would be legally required, legally required to provide the information and to do its best to de-identify, which is exactly what we need and what we expect at that point. It is not the case legally that the de-identification process or the, the, the supposed impossibility of that, and I'm not even sure how that could be impossible, but the supposed uh, uh, impossibility of that would in any way relieve the recipient of the duty to actually provide the information. A subpoena is legally binding. It's under force of law. It's under force of contempt of court, can, uh, potentially, if the committee were to adopt that resolution to hold someone in contempt of court. There is no reason to think that this would become some sort of excuse for noncompliance. It is extremely important, in my view, that the information be de-identified before it even gets to the committee. 
I don't want the committee to sing individual names of people who have cancer. I don't want committee staff to be singing individual names of people who have cancer. It has to be done before it gets to us, and the only way to do that is to say that that's in a subpoena, and therefore it has to have the words, shall be de-identified. Thank you very much. Uh, let me reclaim my time. Um, I'd say to the gentleman from Florida, he trusts the EPA more than I do based upon our experience, and I think that they w very much would be tempted uh, to take it out and say they could not de-identify the information. But uh, I hope they will. If they do not de-identify the information themselves, then we will make sure that it is de-identified. So the purpose of the amendment to protect individuals from having that information, personal information disclosed, um, will be satisfied in my judgment. But appreciate the individual's intent in offering that amendment. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? The gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to speak in favor of the amendment, and I'll tell you an additional concern that I have, and I would yield to the gentleman from, uh, from Florida to uh, respond if he could, is that, um, you know, we're dealing with also two private entities who've made commitments of privacy <coughs> to the, pat the patients, the persons who've undertaken the studies, and we haven't dealt at all with the legal liability of those two entities should information that is private be released to the public, whether the public is this committee or its staff or it's the general public. And so I'm wondering what provisions have been made either in the resolution or in some other uh, instance both for EPA, Harvard, and the ACS with respect to their prospective liability in the event that private information is released. Well, I think that the gentlelady is correct. At that point, I think that Harvard and the American Cancer Society would be facing conflicting legal obligations if they received a subpoena and they were under a contractual obligation not to release the information. I fully expect that under those circumstances, the American Cancer Society and Harvard University may go to court to quash the committee's subpoena. I think that would be an embarrassment for the committee, but apparently there may be no way to avoid that embarrassment for the committee. I do think that if Harvard and the American Cancer Society were to release the information and violate their own contractual obligations, they would be subject to a major lawsuit for invasion of privacy. I yield back. Thank you. And I would imagine that in addition, if they sought to um, to comply with the, uh, with the subpoena and tried to, as the chairman has said, de-identify, which I think is very difficult given volumes of, of documentation, and they were not able to do that successfully, uh, the liability would be extreme. And I suppose the chairman is prepared to come back to the Congress to, um, to provide the resources to make payment to the individuals whose privacy has been, um, been violated. And with that, I would yield up my time in support of the amendment. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Um, Edwards. Um, if there's no further discussion, the vote is on the Grayson Amendment. The gentleman from California, Mr. Takato, is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if it's my recollection of the CISPA debate was over uh, whether the government could compel uh, private Internet companies such as Verizon uh, to turn over <coughs> private information to the government, and it specifically absolved those corporations of liability. Um, my understanding of what this committee is doing is to compel private entities uh, to turn over information with, uh, with personally identifiable information, but yet we are not contemplating any measure to absolve uh, those entities of liability. Um, uh, I just want to point that out. Okay. Gentleman yields back his time. The Mr. question Chairman. is on... Can I, can I, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Buchanan, is recognized. I, I just want to uh, pose a question to, uh, to the minority. Do, do we know if the data that we're talking about was de-identified before it was submitted to the EPA and the EPA used that information to base their regulations uh, on these studies or not? And if that, if the, if they, the if it was, uh, give me a second and then I will. Uh, because if it wasn't, what we're saying here today, I think, is that we trust a bureaucratic federal agency more than we do Congress to protect people's privacy. And I would argue that the elected representatives, at least for the people in my district, have a vested interest in protecting the privacy of my, the people that I represent. So I'd like to know whether uh, the information was de-identified before it was submitted to the EPA. 
Well, if the gentleman would join me. I will you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bouchon. If the gentleman would join me right up here at the front, I understand that that is all that Harvard data is sitting up there, stacks and stacks of it that, in fact, is de-identified. So I'm actually not even sure what it is that we're asking for. I, I take back my time, which means if it's already been de-identified before it was submitted to the EPA, then the argument that private data will be released if the EPA gives us more information from their studies is if the gentleman uh, would not yield, why do we argument. need it when we have it sitting in front of us? Why are we subpoenaing? Why are we issuing my a subpoena time. if it's right in front of us? Reclaiming my time, Je uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Okay, Chairman yields back. The question is on the Grayson Amendment. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say nay. No. In the opinion of the chair, the nays have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. I ask for a recorded vote. Roll call vote has been requested pursuant to Committee Rule 2F and House Rule 112H4. Proceedings on the vote will be postponed. Are there any other amendments? I have an amendment at the desk. Who? Uh, is that well, Ms. Grayson? Okay. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the resolution offered by Mr. Smith, offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. Hmm. Amendment number two. On line seven, after either study, insert, and the identity of who possesses such information. On line eight, after from such studies, insert, identified by the EPA. The gentleman from Florida is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I indicated earlier, uh, as this resolution has been drafted, it is unconstitutional. It does not identify with specificity the person, place, or thing to be produced. It does not identify who, what, when, where, and how because of the phrase, that the offensive phrase, and other custodians of research data from such studies. I understand the purpose of this. I understand that the committee majority uh, intends to uh, use this to potentially get information directly from the American Cancer Society and Harvard University. I would point out to uh, Mr. Bouchon uh, that there's no reason to think that uh, a subpoena to the American Cancer Society and Harvard University uh, would yield de-identified data. There's no reason to think that the Harvard University and American Cancer Society data sets have been de-identified. The only way to make that happen is to order it. But regardless of that, there needs to be some specificity regarding what is meant in this resolution by other custodians of research data. Otherwise, the resolution is flatly unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. I am offering this not in order to defeat what appears to be the apparent purpose of the majority, uh, but rather to effectuate that purpose in a manner that's consistent with the Constitution. I believe that the same people will be getting this subpoena regardless but the resolution itself will no longer offend the Constitution. I yield back. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grayson. I'll recognize myself in opposition. And I know the gentleman is well intended here. Uh, but again, I'm afraid the gentleman trusts the EPA more than I do. Uh, by allowing the EPA to be the one to de designate those individuals who uh, might be coerced into giving us the information that really ultimately puts the authority into their hands as to whether they're going to produce the data or not. They are the decision makers and that is not a power I'm willing to give them. Also, uh, let me uh, add in response to what the gentleman said a few minutes ago and what the gentlewoman from, uh, bon from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, mentioned a while ago and point out the distinction between the authorization of subpoenas that we're actually voting on and the subpoena itself. Uh, the authorization is broad as all types of subpoenas are because you sometimes don't know who has the information. The subpoena that will actually be executed will be very specific and will be directed towards the EPA and no other institutions at this point. Will uh, the gentleman I'll, yield? And I'll be question? happy to yield to the gentleman from Florida. Is the, is the chairman willing to represent at this point uh, that the current intention is to that the, such a subpoena go only to the EPA the American Cancer Society and Harvard University, and will the chair represent that if the subpoena goes to anyone else, the chair will come back to the committee, advise the committee, and allow further proceedings? If the gentleman will yield, the um, subpoena is actually going to be more narrow than the three entities that the gentleman mentioned. It's only going to be going to the EPA. I hope it is not necessary to go to Harvard or the American Cancer Institute. Okay. I yield back. Okay. Thank the gentleman. Uh, the vote is on the Grayson Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. No. Can you chair that nays have it and the amendment is not agreed to? Um, are there any other amendments? If not, we will.
Yes. If there's no further discussion, the question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to request a recorded vote. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> okay, let's just assume I'm calling the vote for the ayes then. And uh, a roll call vote has been requested pursuant to Committee Rule 2F and House Rule 11. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Proceedings on this vote will be postponed. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna, I was just going to say we hadn't had a yeah, roll call vote on the amendment. Right. So That's we true. can't vote on final passage. Yeah. That's correct as well. Uh, we have two votes outstanding on the first Grayson Amendment and then on final passage of the resolution. I know what members want to know, and that is when are the votes going to be rolled to. And um, what I propose we do now, let me, can we proceed on the second bill before we? Uh, we're going to proceed to the second bill, the second item on the agenda today, and finish that, and hopefully we'll be able to have votes shortly after that. And hopefully this will be more bipartisan, too. Uh, pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 2850, introduced by me along with Subcommittee Chairman Stewart and Subcommittee Chairman Lummis, and the clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2850, to require certain procedures in the conduct by the Environmental Protection Agency of its study of the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water resources. With that objection, the bill will be considered as read, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, this item that we consider the EPA Hydraulic Fracturing Study Improvement Act is a simple four-page bill that addresses the Environmental Protection Agency's ongoing study of the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing or drinking water. The bill does two things. First, it requires the EPA to follow basic scientific principles in carrying out the study, which has been designated a highly influential scientific assessment. Second, the bill requires that the EPA study go beyond simply identifying possible impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water. The study must provide objective estimates of the probability, uncertainty, and consequence of any such impacts. This addresses a concern identified on multiple occasions by stakeholders and independent experts since the EPA first proposed its study design in 2011. Requiring the EPA to provide context to any identified risk will maximize the study's utility to both scientists and decision makers, and it will limit the possibility that findings will be misinterpreted or misused. This basic principle has been emphasized repeatedly in committee hearings and correspondence over the last two years, and its inclusion will enhance not only the credibility of the EPA's work on hydraulic fracturing, but also our <coughs> ability to ensure continued safe and responsible production of America's vast oil and gas resources. And that concludes my opening statement, and the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for hers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be relatively brief in my remarks on H.R. 2850 because there's really not much to say about it. Unfortunately, it is another example of this committee's majority doing political messaging instead of legislating. If the majority were really interested in legislating on the issue <laughs> ostensibly being addressed by this bill, they would have had meaningful subcommittee hearings to examine the potential impact of the congressionally mandated study that this bill could have. They would have given EPA time to assess that impact and provide input to the subcommittee of jurisdiction. They would not have skipped subcommittee and instead rushed this bill to a full committee markup one day before the August recess. I have to conclude that this bill is not a serious bill. It coupled with the ill-advised move at today's business meeting to push for subpoenas against EPA, as well as potentially any non-governmental custodians of the data that the chairman is seeking is consistent with the majority's ongoing attempt to cross the House, a representative to discredit EPA's scientific work and to undermine the ability of the new EPA administrator to do a job. I understand that Representative Barrow may offer amendment today to this bill, and I will support that amendment. But I wanted to be clear. I do not intend to support this bill and will not vote for it. We all need to remember that the study that this bill will impact has been well underway and the study's plan reviewed by EPA's scientific advisory board. Members of Congress want the study to proceed unimpeded so that we can get its results in a timely fashion. This bill is at best a piece of political message and at worst something that can seriously delay and undercut the congressionally mandated study. This bill will go nowhere in the Senate. 
But it should not even be coming out of this committee. I yield back the balance of my okay. time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. I recognize myself for a unanimous consent request, which is uh, to enter into the record a letter from the Chamber of Commerce supporting H.R. 2850. Uh, that letter was sent to both myself and the ranking member. Uh, the gentleman from California, Dr. Baer, has recognized the purpose of offering an amendment. And the, and the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2850, offered by Mr. Bear of California. I, I ask you to consent that the amendment be considered as read. With that objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Chairman Smith. I understand the desire of the majority to provide context um, to the ultimate findings of the study. Um, you know, a, as a doctor, I certainly would not want to tell a patient that they have a risk of a particular illness without qualifying that risk as much as I can. And that's the intent of, of this study. However, I also have concerns that the current language of the bill um, perhaps inadvertently could lead to a significant delay in the release of the in-depth, critically important study that the EPA is currently carrying out to determine whether there's a relationship between hydraulic fracturing and groundwater contamination. This study is um, an important component to informing science-based national and state policies in this area going forward. I'm, I'm told that such a delay is not the majority's intent, um, and any delay in the study and delay in the EPA reporting their findings would continue to hinder both the scientific community and industry. So let's hold to the original intent of the study and you know, put those findings forward. Therefore, I'm offering this amendment to ensure that this is the case. The amendment simply states that this, that the final report will be released no later than September 30th, 2016, which is consistent with the study's current timeline. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support the amendment as it in no way would undermine the majority's intent while also ensuring that the report schedule will not intentionally or otherwise be further delayed by the language in the underlying bill. And I yield back. Uh, th uh, thank you, Mr. Baron. I'll recognize myself in support of the amendment. Uh, this amendment, and, and by the way, let me say at the outset, this amendment very much improves the bill, and I appreciate the gentleman's offering it. The amendment requires the EPA to release its final report of its ongoing study of the potential impact of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water resources by September 30th, 2016. The EPA has continually insisted that the final draft report a result should be expected late next year, 2014, with peer review to continue into 2015. So it appears that according to the agency's own projections, they should be able to meet this deadline of 2016. Additionally, this study has been ongoing for three years, and the 2016 deadline is another three years away. While we support the EPA taking a deliberate approach to get the science right, we also should ensure that this study is completed in a timely fashion and not unduly prolonged or otherwise delayed. Given that the agency testified last week that the study is being conducted within a risk framework, the inclusion of estimates of probability, uncertainty, and consequence should not lengthen the study beyond the deadline that this amendment proposes. This amendment gives the EPA an ample time frame in which to complete the study while also ensuring that the study is completed without further delay or expansion of its scope. For these reasons, I support the amendment and urge my colleagues to support the amendment as well. Are there any, any, any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? If not, uh, the vote is on the Barra Amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Uh, the amendment is agreed to. Are there any other amendments? There are no further, the uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Maffei. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an important issue to me and, and my district. Uh, my district uh, is in uh, upstate uh, central New York and relies on a clean water economy, Lake Ontario, the Finger Lakes, Onondaga Lake. All of these natural resources support tourism, agriculture and wineries, clean water dependent industries, and thousands of jobs. We fight a constant battle to preserve our clean waters. We fight against pollution and invasive species. Our communities rely on water resources, and as such, New York has a state moratorium on hydrofracking. Uh, but we face a new threat, the uncertainty created by even the possibility 
that hydrofracking um, may have a disaster that would threaten our clean water economy, that that reputation even is a threat. So our watershed and clean water know no state boundaries, and the federal government shouldn't turn a blind eye to this issue. So that's why I'm pleased that the EPA is looking at it. It's also why I'm a co-sponsor of the bipartisan FRAC Act, which would put fracking under the Safe Drinking Water Act, making the practice subject to federal regulation. Now, the EPA is studying the effects of hydrofracking on drinking water, and the bill we are considering today may postpone the publication of some of those findings. If, as supporters say, fracking is safe, we should be happily anticipating the EPA's findings and not working to postpone them or, or even a piece of them. If, as supporters say, fracking is safe, then they also should have no issue creating a level playing field and applying the safe drinking water standards. Therefore, I will respectfully re oppose this bill today, and I encourage my colleagues on the committee to also oppose the bill. I thank the chairman, and I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Maffei. Are there others? The gentleman from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the chairman for his interest in this issue. I know that we are all interested in getting the best results uh, from the EPA on this important study. Uh, just a week ago yesterday, the chair mentioned to me this concept that we're uh, marking up today and asked me to keep an open mind. I did. I reviewed the chair's memo and the language of the bill multiple times. I just received uh, that language on July 29th, three days ago. I also reviewed the committee memo and the EPA's progress report. I concluded that section one of the bill isn't necessary. The, EPA, the EPA's own progress report from December of 2012 on page four states, the EPA has designated the report of results as highly influential scientific assessment which will undergo peer review by the EPA's Science Advisory Board, an independent and external federal advisory committee that conducts peer reviews of significant EPA research products and activities. So the designation is in place already, and that has already triggered the strictest peer review requirements. With regard to Section 2, this section appears to impose new and ostensibly different research requirements on the EPA. Unfortunately, because there was no hearing on this bill, we do not have information from the EPA regarding whether these requirements will take additional time, and if so, how much time. And importantly, we don't have information about what additional resources, if any, the EPA might require to comply with this language. And I do want to note what's happened in the meantime. The majority has proposed cutting the EPA's budget by 34 percent. So without more information about what would be required to comply with the provisions in this bill, I will be opposing it at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bonamici. Are there other members who wish to be heard? If not, uh, the question is on the bill, H.R. 2850, as amended. Uh, wait a minute. The question is not on the bill. The question is on the... Um, it is on the bill. Uh, on 2850, as amended, those in favor say aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered reported favorably. Um, pursuant, Mr. Chairman, on that I request a roll call vote. For the bill to be reported favorably, I request a roll call vote. Would the gentleman approach the chair for a minute? Okay. A roll call vote has been requested pursuant to Committee Rule 2F and House Rule 112H4. Proceedings on this vote will be postponed. I thank the Chair. Okay. Uh, let me announce to the members that um, there are a couple of classified briefings still ongoing, uh, and members may be attending those classified briefings. So we are going to postpone proceedings on the three pending votes, uh, and we will give members 30 minutes advance notice of the specific time to which we will roll those votes. Uh, so once again, everyone will have 30 minutes notice. It will be this afternoon, and we will stand in recess until that time. The Science, Space, and Technology Committee will reconvene 
Uh, before we get to the scheduled and postponed votes, I want to take a minute to recognize Ellen Scholl. Ellen, stand up just for a second so everybody can say hello and goodbye. I want to recognize Ellen for her hard work, work and dedication to the full committee and the energy and environment subcommittees over the past two and a half years. After this markup, Ellen will be packing up for a long drive back to the great state of Texas, where she will return to UT Austin to pursue a graduate degree at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Ellen, we thank you for your outstanding service to this committee, and we certainly wish you well on your next adventure. Thank you. First item of unfinished business of the committee is the postponed roll call and the amendment offered by Mr. Grayson, amendment number one to the resolution, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Smith. No. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Rohrabacher. Mr. Rohrabacher votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Lucas. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Nagabauer votes no. Mr. McCall. No. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Brown votes no. Mr. Palazzo. No. Mr. Palazzo votes no. Mr. Brooks. No. Mr. Brooks votes no. Mr. Holtgren. No. Mr. Holtgren votes no. Mr. Bouchon. No. Mr. Bouchon votes no. Mr. Stockman. No. Mr. Stockman votes no. Mr. Posey. Mr. Posey votes no. Mrs. Lummis? No. Mrs. Lummis votes no. Mr. Schweiker? No. Mr. Schweiker votes no. Mr. Massey? Yes. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Kramer? No. Oh. <laughs> oh, Mr. Kramer votes no. Mr. Bridenstein? No. Mr. Bridenstein votes no. Mr. Weber? Negative. Mr. Weber votes no. Mr. Stewart? No. Mr. Stewart votes no. Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins votes no. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Mr. Lipinski? Aye. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Edwards? Aye. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Wilson? Ms. Wilson votes aye. Ms. Bonamici? Aye. Ms. Bonamici votes aye. Mr. Swalwell? Aye. Mr. Swalwell vo votes aye. Mr. Maffei? Aye. Mr. Maffei votes aye. Mr. Grayson? Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Mr. Kennedy? Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Peters? Aye. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Kilmer? Aye. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mr. Barra? Aye. Mr. Barra votes aye. Ms. Esty? Aye. Ms. Esty votes aye. Mr. Vesey? Aye. Mr. Vesey votes aye. Ms. Brownlee? Ms. Brownlee votes aye. Mr. Ticano? Aye. Mr. Ticano votes aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Kelly votes aye. Are there any other members who wish to vote or change their vote? If not, the clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 18 members voted aye, and 20 members voted nay. Okay. There were 20, 18 ayes and 20 nays, and the amendment is not agreed to. The next item of unfinished business is the postponed roll call on the resolution, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Smith votes aye. Mr. Rohrabacher. Yes. Mr. Rohrabacher votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner? Mr. Lucas? Mr. Nagabauer? Mr. Nagabauer votes aye. Mr. McCall? Mr. McCall votes aye. Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown votes aye. Mr. Palazzo? Mr. Palazzo votes aye. Mr. Brooks? Mr. Brooks votes aye. Mr. Holtgren? Mr. Holtgren votes aye. Mr. Bouchon? Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Stockman. Mr. Stockman votes aye. Mr. Posey. 
Mr. Posey votes aye. Mrs. Lummis? Aye. Mrs. Lummis votes aye. Mr. Schweiker? Yes. Mr. Schweiker votes aye. Mr. Massey? Aye. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Kramer? Aye. Mr. Kramer votes aye. Mr. Bridenstine? Mr. Bridenstine votes aye. Mr. Weber? Aye. Mr. Weber votes aye. Mr. Stewart? Aye. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Mr. Collins? Aye. Mr. Collins votes aye. Ms. Johnson? No. Ms. Johnson votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Mr. Lipinski? No. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Ms. Edwards? Ms. Edwards votes no. Ms. Wilson? Ms. Wilson votes no. Ms. Bonamici? Ms. Bonamici votes no. Mr. Swalwell? No. Mr. Swalwell votes no. Mr. Maffei? No. Mr. Maffei votes no. Mr. Grayson? No. Mr. Grayson votes no. Mr. Kennedy? Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Peters? Mr. Peters votes no. Mr. Kilmer? Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mr. Barra? Mr. Barra votes no. Ms. Esty? Ms. Esty votes no. Mr. Vesey? Mr. Vesey votes no. Ms. Brownlee? Ms. Brownlee votes no. Mr. Ticano? Mr. Ticano votes no. Ms. Kelly? Ms. Kelly votes no. And the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, there are 20 members who voted aye and 18 members voted nay. In this vote, there are 20 ayes and 18 noes, and the resolution is agreed to. With that objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. And the gentleman from New York, Mr. Maffei, is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I ask unanimous consent that I uh, be allowed to withdraw my request for a roll call vote on the pending matter. Okay, with that objection, thank the gentleman. The question is on the bill, H.R. 2850. Uh, as amended, those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. No. The ayes have it, and the bill, as amended, is agreed to. Now, with that objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. And I move that the bill, H.R. 2850, as amended, be favorably reported to the House, and the staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes, and without objection, so ordered. Uh, there is no further discussion. That completes our business, and this concludes the full committee markup. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>